Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're watching this from, on behalf of Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Engagement and Water Policy Center, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all. I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished chair, Dr. Deepak Prakash Pat, speakers and participants registered for the event. We're glad that you could join us today at the NICE WPC International Conference on Post-Pandemic World Order, Navigating the New Normal. Throughout the three days conference, we will be having 30 sessions that will take place at two Zoom rooms simultaneously. We have around 150 experts and speakers joining us from 30 different countries who will be delivering their presentations and sharing their expertise with us. This is the 11th session of the conference. To chair and moderate this session, it's a real pleasure to have Mr. Deepak Prakash Pat with us. Dr. Deepak, Dr. Deepak Prakash Pat, founding chairperson of Nepal Center for Security Governance, holds a PhD from the School of International Studies, JNU, Delhi. He has served as a member of the Technical Committee and Secretariat of the Special Committee for Supervision, Integration and Rehabilitation of Maoist Army Combatants from March 2009 to December 2012. He's a faculty member at the Masters in Development Studies, DCPDS, and Institute of Crisis Management, ICMS, uh, Tribhavan University. In addition, he's a visiting professor at Armed Police Force Command and Staff College, Kathmandu. The cherry on the cake remains his publications in books, newspapers, and magazines. Without further ado, sir, please take the session forward. Uh, thank you, Paki. Thank you, Pramod. Uh, Dr. Pramod, uh, it's a very uh, honest to be here sharing the session and having a Augustus panel and gathering. Good morning and good afternoon, whatever suits you, friends. And first of all, I would like to thank NICE and WPC team, which has managed this uh, mega event uh, webinar, connecting hundreds of scholars, academicians, journalists, and researchers, and the people, those who have been contributing from different parts of the world you know, enriching the sharing the knowledge uh, culture. And as the panel, you have seen the scholars here, Professor Swarna Singh, he's a professor in CPOD, Center for International Politics, Organizations and the Disarmament in JNU, SIS. Dr. Samburam Simkara and uh, Professor Swarna Singh will be speaking on the the topic, the very interesting, fascinating, and very in depth, in sense of the looking at the from the strategic point of view, reading post COVID 19 China, what Sun Zhu tells us. So, uh, a military strategist which has contributed in a great effort to the Chinese society and the world in military thinking and the military strategy. Sunju, what Sunju tells us. So he will be, he will be talking from that perspective, Professor Swarna Singh and Dr. Samburam Simkara, a colleague of mine, work together in the uh, a special committee, and it's a secretariat and the technical committee, which was formed in the leadership of the prime minister under the leadership of the prime minister, and we got a chance to work with the four prime ministers in that special committee was formed for the integration of the Maoist army, the People's Liberation Army created by Maoist party, the rebel party, and integration into the National Army, Nepal Army, the then Royal Nepalese Army, and then Nepal Army, Nepali Army. And he has served as an ambassador to the uh, UN, Geneva, and he had chaired Human Rights Committee at that point, and now he is a member of the National Defense University, a new project launched by government, of Nepal and a very big achievement for the government and Nepal and the strategic community of Nepal establishing National Defense University and he is heading the subcommittee which will delve on the infrastructure and development 
uh, issues and he will be speaking on the search for a new or the push back to the old you know the post pandemic world order and professor sanjay kumar vardas my supervisor my mentor uh, uh, a professor in uh, sis jnu south asian studies he will be speaking on the indian foreign policy in emerging world order as we see the world order is definitely people are talking about changing or you know uh, uh, maybe uh, in a conjunction or in a, in a flux and he will be speaking on india's foreign policy component and after that a uh, good friend of mine professor shahab he is a professor of uh, international relations and he has been extensively writing and speaking on the issues related to the uh, uh, South Asian security, South Asian cooperation and at this morning he will be speaking in regional cooperation in post-COVID world order. As we see world order in terms of development model, a scholar Scholars and academicians and researchers and the policymakers all are closely watching. Is this going to a, the world is entering into a new world, Cold War, new world order or something like that. And people are talking and looking from the different continent, region, sub-region and country, country specific uh, perspective. And at the same time, people are talking from unipolar world to the multipolar world or the bipolar world again. And again, people are talking about the and looking and dealing with the regional risk and risks in the bilateral and the multilateral uh, forums created like uh, BRICS or you know the uh, some other uh, BIMSTEC, whatever it is, BBIM or BCIM, whatever is coined in the last 20 to 30 years or ASEAN or EU or many things we have seen and in the the biggest achievement of the 19th and the 20th century is as we have seen the nation building or the nation state phenomena. Now that is again, is it shifting in a new new era with the projection of Belt and Road Initiative by China, a global strategy and Indo-Pacific uh, from rebalancing Asia-Pacific to Indo-Pacific strategy of the US and in that context and different scholars have talked about class of civilizations, class of, you know, like uh, and domination of the identity politics to now the populism and challenges posed by populist agenda or the populist or the populism uh, to the established democracy. And, uh, and as I mentioned, like, you know, the development model of the world uh, from uh, China to uh, uh, India and of course from US, Europe and China to India. So that is the whole gamut of the uh, discourse uh, now. But uh, again, I'm very happy and honored and thankful to NICE and WPC team and Dr. Pramod uh, as you have uh, connected uh, 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 scholars and contributors, policymakers throughout the world and, and they are in this forum. So, uh, uh, welcome Professor Sanjay Kumar Bardas. <laughs> Sir, Namaskar. It's my pleasure. I have introduced you. Namaskar. As a panelist and... <laughs> no, no. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Deepak. Uh, the honor to be chaired by you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it's my privilege and honor as I have introduced all the panelists and I, as I have said uh, how post-pandemic world order is to navigate and I'm sure that all the scholarly presentations and as all you have been digging the uh, issues for a quite long time so without delay I will uh, the floor to the professor Swarn Singh. He will be uh, speaking on the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, reading post COVID-19 world through and, and, and analyzing and uh, re, uh, 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 you know, the discussing uh, uh, his uh, understanding about the post COVID-19 world from what Sun Tzu tells us. 
So Professor Shona Singh, now it's uh, floor to you. Thank you, Honorable Chair uh, Dr. Deepak Prakash Bhatt. Also, great congratulations to my dear friend, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, uh, Research Director of uh, NICE or NICE. Post-COVID uh, world order and how are we navigating the new normal? The way Pramod has been organizing uh, these splash of seminars uh, is a reflection in itself as to how equations during and post COVID-19 are going to be completely reset and what are going to be the measures uh, of building or seeking influence uh, at various levels, including in international relations. At center of this uh, navigating of new normal remains uh, People's Republic of China which was really uh, emerging as a system shaping power even before COVID-19. Uh, but at least Chinese believe that COVID-19 has given them a kind of a boost or leapfrog uh, in terms of their economic progress at least, which they have been trying over a period of time to convert into political influence. So in navigating new normal, I assume uh, understanding of Chinese behavior uh, remains a very significant component of uh, what will be new normal and how all of us will be navigating the new normal. Two things uh, are interesting when we look at China. One, the claim that Chinese have that they have already come out of COVID-19 and that makes them a very special uh, influencer during and post COVID-19. And second element, which uh, the world has been talking about, of China's increasing assertiveness. And I'm intentionally using a very, very neutral word here. Uh, assertiveness across the periphery. All the way from South China Sea to uh, Indian borders uh, on, in the Western sector in Ladakh. Uh, so in this, during and post COVID-19, when China is at center of global debate, these two things are perhaps most important to understand how and why and have really Chinese come out of COVID-19 and what explains this acceleration in their such assertive behavior across the periphery. And I'm going to look at this from what my own teacher, Professor Than Chu, used to talk about geo-civilizational perspective, not geostrategic, geo-economic. There is too much debate on uh, geoeconomic, geostrategic uh, components of China's uh, influence uh, role in, in global affairs. And if we look at China's two claims or two behaviors, one of trying to behave as if there is no more COVID-19 for them, second trying to behave that as if they can now assert and achieve in their immediate periphery something that they always aspired for, but perhaps were restrained and could not do that so far. And if we try to look at geo-civilizational lens to understand that behavior, Sun Tzu uh, perhaps uh, becomes very central character again, uh, to understand why is such a behavior visible uh, and can we fathom and understand that behavior a little better. When we talk of Sun Tzu, we talk of uh, a very important book called The Art of War, which of course most authors believe that uh, most experts believe that was authored by multiple people. So Sun Tzu becomes a kind of an institution. Uh, just like similar claims are also made about Shakespeare, for example, that there was no one individual writing that whole literature. So Sun Tzu was not known until about 100 or 150 years ago to the rest of the world. It's only for the first time French translation happened in late 19th century. But the world came to know much about it only when the English translation appeared in 1910. And that was a translation by Leonid Giles. During the Vietnam War, 
then became a Bible in United States. It was in 1963, another translation by Samuel Griffith arrived, and since both Ho Chi Minh and Mao Zedong treated art of war as a Bible, Americans really made it important in all their military academies to understand art of war, to understand the mindset of Chinese and therefore of the Viet Cong guerrillas. The most latest translation of Art of War has appeared from Princeton University PhD, uh, someone called Michael Naila. And in that translation, she makes a very important point. She believes that the entire treatise of Art of War is predicated on the idea that there will be bad luck and that it will come your way and it will keep coming quite regularly. What you do not want it to come from, the bad luck, is from your lack of planning. So you understand Sun Tzu is emphasizing on advanced planning of life. And in the 13 chapters of Art of War, repeatedly that element while addressing different components of war, he's emphasized that advanced planning is important. Second very significant element that explains China's behavior is that many people think it's a treatise on art of war and would be therefore aimed at clear victory. Many people quote Sun Tzu to say, armies should walk into the theater only for celebrations because people who follow Sun Tzu will hollow their enemy without fighting a battle. Or another quotation from Art of War, to win, to fight 100 battles and to win 100 battles is not acme of skill, but to win 100 battles without fighting any of them is acme of skill. So you have to weaken your enemy without actually fighting a direct war. You can see China's behavior right from the periphery that they really took over soon after liberation of China to right up to the behavior vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan as of yesterday. Important element that explains here is that Art of War says that long-term planning is aimed at long-term victory. And in long-term victory, they talk about political war, not military war. So China is focused on winning a political war. And sometimes we keep looking at China's behavior in terms of military strategy, military outcomes, how are they responding to responding to sort of certain successes or, or failures on military skirmishes with any of the neighbors. Indeed, art of war even goes to the extent of saying that at appropriate time, even negotiations can be held where neither side will have a sense of what it called stunning victory. Now, these are the things that become alive in United States in the debates on limited nuclear war. Henry Kissinger, Robert Osgood and several other people did work in 1950, late 1950s, 1960s. But Sun Tzu was talking about it in 6th century BC, in Wu Kingdom. And that time, Chinese kingdoms were fighting exactly like 18th, 19th century European countries were fighting religious wars. So Sun Tzu, among other things, talks here that if you think that there is no danger to you, because there is no present danger in front of your eyes. This is about as stupid a move you could possibly make as you could. So you understand how Mao Zedong in So sometimes China's behavior is defeats or victories that China has had, but Chinese are not aiming themselves in fighting a military victory or defeat, or the political victory or defeat is, is more, more significant. And when it talks about nine contingencies in chapter 8, it underlines the fact, and Sun Tzu says, do not count on the enemy not coming. Depend instead on your side being prepared to confront him as and when he 
shows up. Now, if you look at this in terms of how Chinese have been preparing over a period of time with the four modernizations of Deng Xiaoping, where military is the last fourth element of their modernization. Sustaining that modernization through earlier first three modernizations is significant. Chapter 5 says something really interesting here. It says clever combatant looks to the effects of combined shil, which is energy. So clever combatant, he says, looks at the effects of combined shil developed by good fighting men as in the momentum of a round stone rolled down from mountain thousands feet high. So, two things. One, Chinese look at political war. Second, they look at the multiple elements delivering together as an outcome, not a singular component delivering its outcome. So, when we talk, for example, of a lot of people are questioning today, why are Chinese opening multiple fronts across their periphery? When the whole world seems to be angry with them, at least the Western world seems to be angry with them. They need to go back to Sun Tzu, who says multiple fronts can be opened vis-a-vis -vis one particular enemy because aim is political victory, not the battles on the front. And therefore, the United States is the singular sole adversary or enemy that Chinese are fighting today. And all rest of the countries in the periphery of China are nothing more than friends and allies and cohorts of the United States. And therefore their angst, anger, aggression or assertion in the periphery is part of what Wang Yi recently said, the new Cold War. And that is where you have to understand the focus of Deng Xiaoping on comprehensive national strength. So in that sense, the behavior of assertion of China, the behavior of advanced planning of China, for example, a lot of controversies about how WHO has been manipulated by Chinese. But if you go back to the SARS of 2002-2003, when there was a European politician who was heading World Health Organization, Brundtland, I suppose, if I remember right, had declared advisories on travel to China without consulting China. So that was seen as a Western way, at least the Chinese read it as a Western way of undermining China without giving China a chance to negotiate and engage. So Chinese learned their lessons and started planning. And therefore following from 2006 to 2016 for a full decade, it was a Chinese doctor who was director general of World Health Organization and influenced not just the leadership of WHO, but influenced the processes and structures of this organization such that China will have an opportunity to engage and explain its position in case SARS gets repeated in future. So when COVID-19 happened, Media is now talking of the influence the Chinese wielded in selection of Dr. Tedros, an Ethiopian leader, as Director General of WHO. That's again not a singular proposition to make. Chinese have been wielding influence across all organs and agencies of United Nations. Today, four major agencies out of 15 of United Nations are headed by Chinese. Till recently, for a full decade, I said WHO was headed by a Chinese doctor. So sometimes that incremental, imperceptive, piecemeal wielding and expanding of Chinese influence is what needs to be understood rather than saying, oh, WHO was being manipulated by Chinese from December. That's not how it happened. It's an ongoing, gradual, piecemeal process. And therefore, I think the way we understand Chinese behavior both in terms of controlling COVID-19 
overcoming COVID-19 or at least demonstrating that they have overcome COVID-19 as also their behavior in terms of their expanded, accelerated assertion on the border has to be understood in geo-civilizational sense. And my last component to explain this would be what Sun Tzu, if Sun Tzu was sitting today with us and was talking about what is happening and how to explain this unusual example of Chinese 1.4 billion people being able to manage COVID-19 with such limited damage. And also what explains this across the periphery and of course with the United States is constant assertive behavior of China. He would perhaps go back to something that is civilizationally widespread in Chinese society. The game of Go. In fact, in Chinese, it is called I Go. And people often compare it with chess. <clears throat> most people believe chess was originated in India. And I Go, the game, which most people play, old people even today play, all over China, this game of I Go. They look similar games. They are both on board. There are pieces on the board. But I think that will help us understand how civilizationally, I'm speaking from India, how India and Chinese mindset works. And chess and Daigo are a fantastic comparison to understand that mindset. And Sun Tzu would perhaps use that to understand. Both are board-based games with multiple pieces on top of it. Both also have black and white pieces on top of it. But that's where similarity ends. Chess has 16 pieces black and white, sitting and playing on 64 squares. Aigo has 19 pieces. Now, the difference is, in case of chess, the hierarchy and discipline of the pieces is clearly demonstrated, is known, is established. There could be some surprises. For example, a pawn goes and enters opponent's king's seat, it becomes the king. But that's a surprise at the end of the outcome, towards the end of the outcome. So hierarchy is well defined in chess. Discipline is well defined in chess. In I go, 19 stones on both sides are sitting on a bigger board with roughly about 361 points. Now, unlike chess, where each piece sits inside a square, relatively safe inside square, in Igo, these little stones sit on the crossing points, influencing four squares at the same time. And therefore, their intention also is different. Intention is in chess is to either checkmate, which is capture or kill. But that's not the intention in Igo. Intention in Igo is sustain your liberty and undermine your opponent and not allow the opponent to come in the periphery. So where in chess we are trying to kill and achieve a clear victory. In Igo, it is constantly building of a kind of a sequence of stones, which is not aimed at harming, killing other opponents pieces, but to capturing the territory, larger space on that board. And the winner is declared based on the last stone capturing bigger territory. Uh, Professor Sranasing, so I will request here to you to wrap up your presentation. In 30 seconds, sir. Thank you. So fundamentally, both at the geo-civilizational level, when you look at how the great philosophers like Sun Tzu explained Chinese behavior and mindset, as also at the most mundane level of common people playing I go, and I compared it to chess to highlight the difference. The Chinese mindset has to be understood very differently and most of us in the English speaking word, world, guided by Anglo-Saxon intellectuals, perhaps are looking at the wrong tree to understand the Chinese behavior. And if we have to understand the new normal, 
where China is sitting at the center and is going to be far more influential than it has been before. And we want to navigate in the new normal as the theme of this three-day seminar is. We perhaps need to understand both the intellectual scholarly mindset and the common man's mindset to understand the Chinese behavior, both in terms of controlling, achieving, and asserting that they are out of COVID-19 and also their newfound enthusiasm, emboldened behavior of what West is calling wolf warriors. What explains that behavior? Once we try to understand it from geo-civilizational perspective, perhaps we'll be better prepared to navigate the new normal as your theme says. Thank you, Chair, for being a little indulgent with me. I think I took a minute extra. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, as Professor Swarna Singh, uh, thank you for your uh, extensive presentation as you have been taking on the Chinese uh, development in terms of uh, strategic or the military or the geo-civilizational as you are talking about that particular sense, which is rarely used uh, in Western uh, academia or the research community. What I found, I know, uh, 5th century BC, what Sun Tzu tells uh, to the world or the Chinese civilization is, is still uh, valid in each and every uh, dimensions of Chinese civilization. That is, you know, from the military thinking to business and, 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 and of course, uh, their lifestyle. And 5th century BC, yes, also uh, South Asian context or Indian context uh, is called stress. Chanakya for his contribution to the strategic, uh, you know, area. Uh, and but uh, for East and uh, Eastern uh, region uh, and Sunju has influenced uh, all that thinking and about uh, more than uh, 2000 plus years, uh, the, that particular, the treaties have been uh, aloof from the rest of the world, but uh, thanks to the translators <laughs> from uh, John Joseph to the, uh, the, the scholar Snaila, you know, Neguen, uh, all these have contributed a lot and we can see now how, you know, uh, Sunju has contributed not only to the art of war and how the rest of the world uh, and Chinese thinking is different. And as you have rightly pointed out, how, what Sunju tells us in, in his, uh, the composed uh, book, uh, as you said, uh, it may be single person to final make the 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 uh, treatise that but and maybe many scholars or many military thinkers have contributed to that, and uh, it has opened uh, our uh, understanding about the geo civilizational uh, contribution. And as I was mentioning briefly, you know, some people talked about the class of civilizations, and now uh, in terms of uh, development strategy, people are talking about the class of development model, the West, and now the Chinese model. So that is another. And now uh, I will introduce uh, Dr. Samburam Simkara. I have introduced him, him earlier, but and I will give it to the floor to the uh, Dr. Simkara. Uh, and Mr. Simkara is talking on the uh, the world order, post-pandemic world order, and search for uh, a new or the pushback to the old. The the big uh, dilemma or the confrontation. How. Uh, the world will be navigating in this post-pandemic uh, uh, scenario. So, doctors, without uh, any delay, I will uh, hand over floor to the doctors, Ambassador Simkara. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted uh, uh, to be participating in this uh, in this discussion, uh, and of course, uh, a great pleasure to to speak uh, immediately after uh, a dear friend and, uh, and a very well-known scholar, uh, Professor Singh. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I find the timing and of course the sequencing of the speaking uh, uh, schedule absolutely wonderful because uh, Professor has spoken about Sun Tzu. And of course, I will be making a lot of reference in terms of uh, this dilemma between um, you know, whether there is going to be a rush back to the same old order, or in fact, are we really looking for a new order? Mr. Chairman, during the long lockdown, going through old collection of my books and papers, 
I found two fascinating articles I collected as a student of international relations in the United States in the 1980s. Uh, at the height of the last Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. One, choosing a strategy for World War III by Thomas Powers, a renowned American historian, and the other, uh, designing the next century by a German physicist philosopher, Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker, who later also became president of Germany. On different subjects, there is a common thread making both articles relevant for today as China replaces the former Soviet Union in the new Cold War with the US. About the previous Cold War, Powers, the historian, writes, and I'm quoting Mr. Chairman, when deterrence failed in 1940, the war that followed was awful beyond precedent. But it ended as wars traditionally do, with victory on one side, defeat on the other. This is not the way the war would end if deterrence failed today. End of quote. The physicist Bon Weizsäcker, <clears throat> supporting the historian powers, writes, and I'm again quoting, after a nuclear war, none of our dreams for the 21st century would have any meaning, end of quote. Today, there are simulations on conventional naval warfares. Some even I have observed during the wonderful program that uh, uh, Dr. Jaiswal has organized in his own forum very recently. There are debates about blockades and counter busters in South China Sea, the Taiwan Straits, and of course, the major choke points around the Indian Ocean. But can one predict the nature and consequences of a US-China war? History's biggest lesson significance, Mr. Chairman, is learning its lessons. That is what makes understanding of history a vital part of the study and practice of international relations. In this assembly of scholars, which the organizers called Kumba, very rightly, of some practitioners, mostly scholars, some practitioners, a political leader like yourself, Mr. Chairman, and a few like me on both sides of scholarship and diplomacy. I want to start with a question which has been stirring my mind as a student, teacher, and practitioner of international relations. With a long history of wars and conflicts, scholars today say that a war between and among the major European great powers of yesterday and some today, like Germany, France, Italy, Austria, Spain, and Portugal, is not only improbable, but unthinkable. Can we say the same thing about some of the other great powers of today? US, China, Russia, or China, India, Japan. And if not, my question to all involved in both the study and practice of international relations today, Mr. Chairman, is why not? What prevents these great powers from evolving out of the traditional, what I would call hegemonic and conflictual polarity, enter into a new stage of cooperative and competitive plurality, consistent with the dynamics of time and technology? Seeking answer to this question is the most critical part of IR scholarship and diplomacy if they are to contribute to the preservation and upliftment of humankind and not let obsession 
with power and profit inflict pain and sorrow on common humanity as often experienced at different times of history. Although relevant today, this is not a new question, Mr. Chairman. In different ways, this is a question Edward Hallett Carr in the 20 years crisis, an introduction to the study of international relations. One of the first books on the subject was asking while analyzing the causes and consequences of the two world wars, starting from Europe and engulfing the whole world. Professor Stanley Hoffman at Harvard warned those celebrating the supposed end of the Cold War as the end of history. And I myself, in a lecture to the class of new officers of Nepal's Ministry of Foreign Affairs in February 1994, and subsequently many places beyond have been asking, do we really know what the often repeated rhetoric end of the Cold War really means? And if not, and if the present trends continue, what is the guarantee it will not be replaced by a new Cold War with its epicenter moving from Europe and the transatlantic to closer to home? Sometimes, Mr. Chairman, a thinker wishes what he thought, said, or wrote at one stage of history turns out to be untrue. Sadly, things cannot be wished away. When not just politics and diplomacy, but scholarship too becomes prisoner of history, rather than learning and teaching its lessons, that is when the world keeps repeating again and again what it vows never again. As one such blunders, we are now told US-China Cold War is already here. And if they don't change their modes of behavior, the Thucydides trap, believed to have compelled two Greek city-states before even the modern calendar started, next to nuclear powers of the 21st century, I quote the title, Destined for War. As I wrote in my latest piece in US-China, Destined for War, question mark, do we know what the consequences, what US-China war can do to the hopes and dreams of not just the Americans, and the Chinese, but the whole humankind, and why avoiding it is the central question in contemporary study and practice of international relations. In one of the best books on the life of Mahatma Gandhi, Louis Fischer writes about the partition of India, and I'm quoting, Jinnah's strength was the threat of civil war. Gandhi, the towering symbol of unifying nationalism was himself a mingling of an obsolete past, a struggling present, and the unborn world of his high ideals." End of quote. The world, Mr. Chairman, today struggles to comprehend the real nature and causes and consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic to find cure and deal with the devastating consequences. I see the need to revisit all assumptions on which we have based our theories and practices. Uh, Dr. Simkhara, I'll just uh, remind you for uh, wrapping up your presentation. You have- uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, was I yeah. even have- uh, You have three minutes, yeah. 15 minutes? Yeah, well, you have three minutes. Just alarming you. <laughs> you have three minutes. So the world today struggles to comprehend the real nature of this pandemic, primarily in many areas, but most significantly on the nature of power and how it is exercised, making many the traditional assumptions of what makes a country powerful, sometimes powerless. 
So Mr. Chairman, inspired by this vision, Gandhian vision of an unborn world of high ideals in the search for a new world order that I call competitive and cooperative plurality. I see the centrality of India in moderating the two extremes. Now, can India rise to the occasion? What role India decides to play, in my view, will largely influence what the global craft trying to navigate in the cloudy ocean of post-COVID-19 world moves, rush back to the same old or search for a real new, where humanity coexists in peace with itself and mother nature. In turn, what role India plays will also depend on the situation in the immediate neighborhood, especially the way the most powerful in this region which India considers its main competitor, but also could, be, could also be a partner in peace, security, and transformative global politics also plays. This is where I see the uniqueness and importance of Nepal-India relations. For if these two neighbors, interlinked by multiple bonds of history, geography, politics, economic, culture, and security, cannot find the true essence of their close, closeness, it is difficult to imagine which other two countries can find this relationship in the new post-COVID-19 world order. Mr. Chairman, uh, post-COVID-19, in my view, is both a, an opportunity and a warning to humanity to change its ways or be forced to change. There is a sloka in, uh, in one of the Puranas, where it says, Jale Vishnu Thale Vishnu, Vishnu Parvata Mastake, Jwala Mala Kule Vishnu, Sarvam Vishnu Jagat Neham. In other words, God exists in all creations of nature, whether animate or inanimate. Today, we are still struggling to comprehend what caused the COVID-19 pandemic, how long it will last, and how we will deal with it. One is clear that, in fact, human behavior in terms of how we behave individually, how our institutions behave, and how the most powerful of the institution human mind created to govern itself, called the nation state, behaves. And unless they change, I'm afraid there might be future pandemics forcing us to change our behavior. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Simkara. Thank you for your extensive presentation. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you are again recalling the 50th century a scholar, a strategician, I mean, uh, a real uh, a political, I mean, this political scientist word I mean, though we rarely used for him, uh, uh, who has contributed a lot in terms of uh, uh, strategy again, uh, a historian who has written a book called The History of the Peloponnesian War, where he's talking about the, I mean, the, uh, the writers like uh, Graham T. Allison is uh, bringing him into the, the new uh, Cold War discourse or the two sided trap uh, in terms of. You know, like uh, as part of the Athensa context, that like how U.S. or the remaining super, I mean, existing superpower will be challenged by upcoming one, something like that. And what you are talking about, the you know the the always the great powers uh, have accepted, you know, the or the projected the claims in a, in a uh, newer. Uh, I mean, upcoming scenario and the standards they have tried to maintain is is may not work because uh, you know in a, in a scientific you know, way of analyzing the history, as you have rightly pointed out, that yes, the challenges and the prospects are there in uh, uh, in uh, this particular scenario of uh, 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 this pandemic, and is it that you know the will the world order or the world Politics will be, you know, moving towards the new, or is the rush back to the old? You have uh, given uh, uh, your 
uh, insights and what you have been talking for uh, many years and uh, like that. And now uh, with this, uh, I will give flow to the professor Sanjay Kumar Bardas, my supervisor, my uh, 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 mentor and uh, as always, uh, he has been uh, talking about uh, how India and as he is going to speak on uh, on India's foreign policy, Indian foreign policy in emerging world order. He has been writing uh, and is speaking about how Indian institutions or, or you know the uh, foreign policy making uh, foreign policy making process is going on, and and. He, so he will be analyzing post-pandemic world order and navigating the new normal and making of the Indian foreign policy or the influence of the Indian foreign policy in emerging world order. So Professor, the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Deepak. Uh, I'm very happy that you're chairing this session. It's my pleasure and my honor to, uh, to make presentation uh, I do feel that uh, while uh, Professor Swan Singh is there and Dr. Shah Inam Khan is also there, so I do feel that I am in JNU and we are uh, basically we are doing this conference in JNU. Uh, that that it gives me a feeling. Uh, so thank you very much. I also extend my thanks to uh, Pramod. Of course, he's also uh, be part of JNU. So <laughs> it's an extended uh, JNU family now in different countries. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Deepak. I would uh, focus uh, uh, my uh, since I'm I'm looking that how uh, what what would be the new directions of India's foreign policy in new normal? What are the continuity and what would be the changes uh, in, uh, in 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 uh, near future that would take place? So I would discuss uh, these uh, these these aspects into two uh, different. Uh, uh, aspects so one you can say the structural aspects and and in in must uh, in functional aspects that how the india's forum in uh, post covid world order and uh, be, uh, india being a largest democracy where you can see uh, uh, more than 700 to 800 people vote at a time has definitely a strong credit credential before uh, before the world community, it's a rule-abiding uh, country, and has uh, while they are making the foreign policy, they have uh, the different stakeholders at domestic front to uh, to make its uh, its foreign policy, and it is of course very much different from what the what the other uh, other extra regional powers, particularly the China, takes a uh, distance while they are uh, they are. Uh, making their foreign policy. They have more of a top-down approach rather than uh, having a bottom-up approach where India being a, a being a largest functional democracy has very much uh, 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 the opinion of different uh, stakeholders while they are making its foreign policy. Of course that India's uh, credentials and, and ethos of secularism, secularism that makes it a, 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 a larger power uh, in the world is also very very close to uh, its foreign policy of course india is also uh, also an a, 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 a to, uh, uh, economy and a military power particularly after uh, becoming a nuclear power it has been recognized so what would be uh, the focus in in, in, in new normal I am going to uh, focus. I do find there are three clear-cut policy directions that uh, India is taking and would uh, I hope I think would continue uh, in future. First, uh, uh, it is it is well well uh, well articulated by the scholars that uh, developing a strategic partnership with the United States uh, for considering its geoeconomic and geostrategic uh, interest in India in South Asia and of course in Indo-Pacific region, but I would uh, I would say that I think this is uh, not uh, a new direction in a way because I do find from 1947, 1948 uh, uh, onward, while Nehru 
uh, Nehru was the Prime Minister of India. India always tried to have very close proximity with uh, with uh, with United States. The first visit uh, Nehru took that was uh, U.S. But U.S. did not basically uh, entertain in a way what it entertained uh, Pakistan and Turkey uh, for a while because Nehru was not uh, in mood to uh, work on the terms and conditions what the United States wanted uh, to impose on India. So India tried always in, in, in even 1962 and then in 1971 crisis, India went to the United States, Indira Gandhi went to the United States and tried to align with the uh, uh, US and asked to intervene uh, while there were crises in, uh, in Pakistan, uh, Bangladeshi people asking for an independent state. So, uh, but the, the shift had been taken place while India had become a nuclear power and had started emerging as an economic power in uh, in, 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 in late 90s or you can say in, in, in 21st century. And there I do find a very interesting, uh, very interesting aspect that uh, that uh, that uh, India and United States had come closer in last two decades, but and very significant uh, agreements had been signed, particularly that. 2005 nuclear deal and, and in 2016 we have gone for uh, the logistic agreement uh, with with uh, United States. But I would submit one very very significant point that this is all Western uh, Western scholars discourse that India had developed close proximity uh, with uh, with uh, United States, but it's not. I I think that United States had started taking interest in uh, in in in. Uh, India or in South Asia, and in the United States found India more uh, more convenient, more uh, more uh, uh, suitable for its uh, interest in, in Asia and Indo-Pacific region. And United States changed its policy, made its split in its policy, and developed close proximity uh, with uh, with India uh, in and asking India to act. Uh, act and act in Southeast Asian countries or Indo-Pacific region as well as in South Asia, particularly in the issue of Afghanistan, Trump had uh, indicated that India should have do more, uh, should, should do more in uh, in in in, uh, in its uh, uh, efforts. So my uh, my point is that that India, uh, it is United States that found uh, India more uh, more. Uh, important, uh, more strategically, more significant, geoeconomically more significant uh, country in Asia and started allying. Of course, China, uh, balancing China is one of the factor uh, uh, for India as well as, as and United States. So there is conversion of interest uh, between the two countries uh, uh, on issue of terrorism, on issue of China, on issue of uh, all other geostrategic and economic uh, alliances uh, between the two countries. The second, uh, I do find that India is in shaping its foreign policy in a way that how to cope with rise of China, and that is a big question before all the policymakers in India. This is highly debated that how to cope with uh, uh, rise of China. China is an uh, uh, is an emerging uh, world power, is an economic power, and it's and it's a military power. Some do find that China is a is a threat to uh, to many of the neighboring countries, including India. Some of the scholars they talk that no, China is an opportunity uh, for the neighboring countries and the Asian countries, and we should align with China. We should entertain China uh, the, the, by different MBC, uh, the different projects what the Chinese has proposed, like Belt and Road initiatives and all all that. India. Uh, from the very beginning, particularly from Rajiv Gandhi period, you do find that India tried to develop a foreign policy that we would we would engage ourselves uh, economically and politically. And because of that uh, that policy, uh, we uh, the, the bilateral trade between India and China had reached about uh, 95 billion. Though we have a huge trade imbalance with uh, with, uh, with with China. But there, one another understanding had been developed that India would adopt a, a, a policy of status quo on border issues that we would not uh, basically encroach and 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 we will not we will believe in the principles of coexistence. So that kind of policy 
uh, had been adopted by, uh, by, by, by India and, and China. But in the recent past, we do find, uh, particularly in, in last four or five years, the issue of Noklam and, and Ladakh, we do find that China is not stuck on the policy of the status quo on border, maintaining peace and transparency on, 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 on border issues. And what I do find in further uh, that the two countries, they have basically uh, moreover engaged in a way to balancing each other on in different uh, regions or, in, or in, in each other's region. And I do find that we, what the, how the Chinese are coming to South Asian countries, they are building different ports, they are building different uh, infrastructures, investing in, in Sri Lanka, investing in Bangladesh, in, in, in Maldives. Uh, in, in, in in Nepal, the way and uh, uh, they are uh, the India is not uh, not uh, joining them, and particularly by what where the, the Chinese are investing in what is uh, China Pakistan economic corridor that passes through the disputed land that Pakistan uh, occupied Kashmir, and that India has a serious uh, sovereignty issues and serious objections to uh, to. That, that China and it irritates the relations uh, between uh, these two countries. But not only in South Asia, if you are going to the other parts of the world, particularly in Southeast Asian countries, where uh, where in South China Sea or in Vietnam, India wanted to invest in uh, in oil sector. The China has objections that it is a disputed areas. So uh, and that 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 had India had a hard competition in Vietnam, in 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 Myanmar, and of course in. Uh, in, in, in West Asian countries as well. So uh, there is a uh, there is an issue. Uh, uh, this this would continue that how to cope uh, with the rise of China uh, China in this uh, new uh, new uh, normal. But the third very important point, what I try to touch here, is that uh, the third policy shift I do find uh, in India's, and that would take place. That would be very crucial, very important that India's neighborhood policy and India's South Asia policy, that I'm going to focus much about that. India's strategic alliance with the United States and India's uh, concerns and India's engagement with China uh, or uh, in, in, in policy, uh, in, in, its, in, in its policy. I do, uh, we are very much familiar that uh, we are part of common ecological uh, system. We, are, uh, we, we, we say common heritage, culture, tradition, history and, and we have civilizational affinities, though we are politically divided. But this is uh, one of the most uh, or least, inter least integrated region in the world. So what, uh, what uh, being this close proximity, being an Indocentric region, that there are very significant, very important uh, factors that distance the neighbor. And that I comes to structural aspects of uh, of India's uh, foreign policy or India's neighborhood policy. And do, I do find there is a asymmetry in real power of the region in, in keeping the size and economy and the military uh, uh, of India and while dealing with the neighboring countries. And that, uh, that, uh, that asymmetry gives an apologetic behavior to the neighboring countries that we, uh, if India doesn't, have, uh, if India is, you know, is, is not an opportunity, if India is a military power, then we should develop, we, we should find an opportunity and, and we should align with the extra regional powers. And there China comes in, uh, in, in this uh, uh, post uh, uh, Cold War period, you can say. And all the countries, they are trying to align economically and militarily uh, with, with China. Uh, uh, and, and uh, so this is one uh, structural aspect that creates uh, uh, creates or distance the neighboring countries in in South Asia. And of course, there are legacies of uh, legacies that South Asian countries carry and distance each other. Particularly, what I saw uh, the, the the partisan of 1947 and the partisan of 1971. And this partisan is basically unfinished part partisan. There are a lot of problems, and that creates mistrust and this differentiating threat perceptions among, uh, among uh, the South Asian uh, countries between India I want to and India. You have three minutes remaining, sir. Oh, okay. So I do find that India now keeping this entire in South Asia in mind and keeping entire 
the new uh, in, in this new uh, in the pandemic that what would be what are the new normals what india is going to emphasize in its foreign policy that there would be first uh, uh, functional aspects would be that india will enhance uh, or give more emphasis to its economic diplomacy and try to cultivate build uh, a, a strong supply chain try to in, uh, try to have more investment from different corners of the world and will try to mobilize uh, the, the indian origin people or you can say indian diaspora to invest in india so that would be the first functional uh, area that india would uh, cultivate would work uh, to, to have more investment more uh, uh, market oriented economy second india would consciously very consciously will de uh, develop military diplomacy or uh, develop the strategic partnership already india has a uh, strategic partnership with 37 countries but now what the, the way india is giving indications asking on malabar exercise and so it is an indication that india may uh, may uh, join quad uh, not purely an strategic purpose but for economic purpose as well. so this would be the second sip the third uh, would of course uh, would be the that india would emphasize to uh, to use soft power strategy uh, uh, in a way uh, in a way to make more credentials in the world where get more support on the issues of terrorism get more support uh, in the issues that that developments taking place in south asian countries particularly on issue of uh, of uh, of uh, china and there india would try to develop in a democratic alliance with the democratic countries where modi had started while he visited to japan and asked to have a a democratic alliance so that uh, india would focus more on on uh, on democratic uh, 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 alliance and fourth there would be the organizational uh, changes uh, would take place with uh, the indian foreign policy making it more i think more uh, uh, prime minister centric uh, foreign policy india uh, i think what india would further emphasis on the fourth policy areas with the neighboring countries so that you can develop closer relations with the neighboring countries i'll take only two minutes to explain it and then i can answer that what where india try to have a uh, reciprocal relations with the neighboring countries but it would make, it would emphasize it would further the policy of gujral uh, gujral where he introduced non reciprocity with the neighboring countries keeping the developments in neighboring countries are taking place in bangladesh in nepal in uh, sri lanka of course india would also talk uh, will also emphasize on constructive unilateralism that we should do more in the develop for the developments of the neighboring countries we should extend more economic assistance to uh, the, the neighboring countries uh, to bangladesh to nepal uh, so that you can minimize whatever the deep pockets are coming from uh, china and all that third would be of course india would would, would, would emphasize on on multilateralism rather than the bilateralism with the region so that you can have more uh, multilateral uh, or you can say multi aligned uh, groups uh, to to advance the indian interest and fourth would india would uh, emphasize on on the resource sharing formula rather than the resource uh, nationalism formula so these are the major uh, major trends that india india's foreign policy uh, would take place but how the neighboring countries would respond to the india's foreign policy that is a question b i just uh, i just i just sub submit one question while india is giving becoming a largest uh, india has given largest line of credit to bangladesh it is around 8, 8 billion dollars that uh, line of credit had been given still bangladesh is is looking china as an opportunity asking chinese to invest in the sensitive zones like uh, building uh, uh, silat airport and asking china to invest in tista issues so i think mm -hmm. india has to keep in mind and keep in mind these developments to uh, to minimize the chinese investment and to address the grievances that the neighboring countries have like in bangladesh nepal and sri lanka no. thank you very much uh, thank you professor thank you professor sanjay uh, for your uh, very intensive presentation and what we see that in its foreign policy making process how india is is looking at the emerging world order in post pandemic though humanity has 
traveled many pandemics, but in the modern world now we are looking how emerging uh, global, I mean, emerging powers, uh, or economic powers like India, is looking the changing uh, world order and the, uh, 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 taking its step uh, to reshape or the shape its uh, for reorient its foreign policy. And while uh, earlier we have seen that you know in the East Asia it was talking about the look east policy, now it's act east policy. Many connecting uh, connecting. Uh, points are there, investments are there. Similarly, it's uh, working on West Asia part. So this is how uh, India is, is searching its uh, new partnership in the uh, Quad and uh, uh, making its relation with China, vis uh, US in terms of Indo-Pacific strategy and all, all these things. So uh, we'll be talking uh, in, in a few moments uh, in that. Now, uh, Professor Sahab Inam Khan, a prolific uh, a scholar on the South Asian context, and, and he is going to talk on how the regional cooperation will take a shape in the upcoming world order in the post pandemic scenario. And in South Asia, especially, though we have a BIMSTEC, we have a BBIM, we have a BCIM on the other part uh, from uh, Chinese side. China is investing in, in CPAC form and, and uh, Hamad Dota case is, is, is uh, uh, must talk. So uh, these are the situations, how and what are the prospects in this context. So a good friend of mine, uh, we have been uh, sharing forums and talking in many uh, places together, but uh, it's my pleasure to uh, give floor to the Professor Sahab. Uh, you thank you, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, <coughs> At the onset, I must uh, mention that uh, uh, Professor Sanjay Bhatwas is not only your supervisor, but my supervisor too. So uh, <laughs> he has been the <laughs> kindest supervisor that we can always think of, who has uh, aptly and sincerely guided us to uh, our excellence in terms of our studies and the degree. And uh, henceforth, I think uh, he deserves an extra uh, thanks from uh, both Professor uh, Dr. Bhad, myself, and of course Pramod. Uh, and, and I'm quite sure the accumulation of wealth that will be generated, uh, wealth of knowledge that will be generated from this session uh, should be attributed to Professor Bhadwaz because this is where the whole genesis of academic tolerance, academic diversity, and of course academic understanding comes in. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Bhad, and thank you, uh, Professor Bhadwaz. Uh, let me start with uh, two very critical points uh, from Jane. Uh, in the Energy Studies program, there was a greater initiative to study energy cooperation across the region, and it was spearheaded by Professor Bhadwaz, uh, which not only includes the South Asian countries, but also the Southeast Asian countries. And that's perhaps one of the very interesting uh, output that came from Professor Bhadwaj's uh, research is the energy community. And South Asian energy community or cross South Asian or Pan Asian energy community. And that's precisely where the multilateralism comes in. And Professor Bhadwaj has obviously touched upon the very critical issue of multilateralism, uh, which is of course a critical factor too. And uh, I must also say, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Sharan Singh has rightly mentioned that what uh, uh, Sanju envisaged and understood in terms of uh, security, in terms of geography, in terms of mapping, is perhaps is slightly different than what Beijing is thinking. And I think this is a very important uh, finding that uh, uh, Professor Singh has brought up. And that's the reason we also have to understand that uh, the uh, quite uh, aggressiveness, or perhaps if aggressiveness is not the right word, perhaps the proactive uh, presence of China and in the vacuum of multilateralism and the vacuum of uh, intra-regional trade is perhaps something that we are going to see in the long run if we don't really address it. And even the vaccine issue, which has been now much debated, 
uh, has uh, another dimension, which is a vaccine nationalism versus vaccine internationalism. And we can perhaps see that uh, uh, Trump administration has pulled out itself from WHO, uh, certainly gives uh, much more greater leverage to the European Union uh, countries as well as China to assume the leadership. And perhaps uh, Dr. Singh has uh, also mentioned one very critical factor that how Chinese leadership in multilateralism is gaining. Even if you look at the uh, uh, post, uh, uh, COP21, even the uh, lack of interest from Washington has uh, obviously given uh, uh, preference for other countries to assume leadership and Beijing is not exceptional. And obviously uh, in line with what uh, Professor Vardwaj has said, and of course you have mentioned, and obviously I bring in, uh, the ambassador's point of view, is very important. Look at the new financial architecture growing up uh, or, or becoming uh, uh, as a, an alternative to the Bretton Woods, uh, such as the World Bank and IMF, AIIB is there. Uh, now the, the Chinese have created a number of uh, uh, initiatives, including a new development bank, uh, contingent, uh, contingent reserve arrangement, new Silk Road Fund and whatnot. So these are all creating an alternative to the long existing ideas of Bretton Woods. So you're now going to see a new kind of financial architecture uh, emerging uh, in the post COVID world. And even if you look at uh, now that the, the Chinese have a similar model of USAID or DFID, uh, UK governments, uh, something called China Development Cooperation Agency. So you're also seeing that the development agenda, which has long been pursued by the Western countries are now being filled in by the Chinese uh, government. So these are the hardcore reality that is coming up in front of us. And obviously taking cue from uh, Professor Bhardwaj, even if you look at SARC, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India has taken a lead after six years of uh, uh, break in SARC's regular activity. And he convened a, a regular meeting, uh, as an online meeting for all the uh, stakeholders to come in. And he has actually mentioned the urgency to fight uh, the COVID-19 situation. And COVID-19 situation is not going to go away anytime soon. And such a pandemic will once uh, and possibly will come back with the new viruses being found, uh, found in Siberia, in Antarctica, and where not. So that's going to be a very important uh, denominator for the South Asians to rethink their multilateralism because one COVID has showed that even ICU beds and everything is insufficient. So where are we going to put our money into? So there is also, even Pakistan came up with four, uh, four pillar provision. Afghanistan talked about telemedicine. Bangladesh has lent its uh, support to everyone. And obviously, uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan's uh, leadership has strongly reiterated their support for collective effort in that particular uh, virtual meeting. So that gives a great hope that the SARC will eventually be a, an important factor in the multilateral discussion. Same is the same as BIMSTEC. Even if you take these two institutions, I mean, for Bangladesh Myanmar relationship, uh, where, where Rohingya refugee issue is a big concern for Bangladesh. And India's current uh, state of relationship with uh, Pakistan and Nepal all comes within the bracket of both SARC and BIMSTEC. And perhaps this is why uh, we all have to be very serious about SARC and BIMSTEC. And obviously, if you take um, the case of uh, lack of intra regional trade, less than 5% compared to ASEAN, even the uh, uh, African Union, uh, unity, and altogether our uh, rate of uh, intra-regional trade is so low that it is natural for any extra-regional uh, entities to come and invest over here in the absence of these trade regimes. Now, even if you take uh, BIMSTEC, SARC once again, SARC uh, was coined by Bangladesh and uh, is now being hosted by Kathmandu. And uh, you are sitting in a very important place where um, SARC headquarters is situated. BIMSTEC's headquarters is situated in Dhaka. These are all very close to the heart of the political leaderships across the region, including, of course, India. 
Now, Nepal and Bhutan's access to Bay of Bengal, uh, Bangladesh's access to electricity in Nepal and Bhutan, India's access to Northeast India, to Bangladesh transit and everything is now falling into pieces uh, and, and uh, everybody is now becoming much more unified than ever. What we need is to bolster the process as soon as possible. Even if we look into the very important factor of uh, the case of regionalism, and regionalism's basic premise is always trade. So therefore we go back to the whole idea of trade, investment, financial regime, and perhaps this is a high time to look for the South Asian regional uh, economic uh, framework to be revived and then accordingly to work. The question again for Bangladesh and India and Myanmar, even Thailand has come up that how we are going to ethically exploit the resources in Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean. For all these things, again, we will need a new standards, new norms, which is uh, fundamentally becoming different than the existing international law, international norms and standards. This is another factor for uh, recovery of the economy, at least for Bangladesh, that much I know, that staggering $13.3 billion loss has to be recovered uh, this way or the other. And perhaps Bay of Bengal's exploitation of resources and ethically environmental friendly way is one of the way for Bangladesh to move ahead. And this is the same case for not only Bangladesh, but also for Myanmar and West Bengal and below. So again, the whole idea of how are we going to, because if we explore, exploit the resources in Bay of Bengal, obviously the implication will be in the side of the Indian maritime boundary and of course Myanmar's maritime boundary. So we have to come to some sort of consensus, even as Professor Vardwaz's reports uh, found that even if you want to have an energy community, you have to have your own standards. So these standards have to be built uh, in consensus with all the, uh, all the stakeholders over here. Even if you look at the economic crisis, I mean, our economic crises are pretty much same. If the Middle East goes volatile, there is a serious problem of remittance flows in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Nepal, and where not. And, and that's exactly, we need to have some sort of uh, protection mechanism in the case of uh, falling of the remittances coming in. Even if you look at poverty, if you look at health, eco economic recovery, as I mentioned earlier, all falls into the one bucket uh, in the post, uh, uh, post COVID world. And we have to manage it uh, collectively. If we don't uh, manage it collectively, certainly the uh, cheaper goods coming from anywhere, whether it, is in, uh, whether it is China, whether it is Central Asia, whether it's Africa, is something that we will have to bear with. And that's the uh, international trade. And that's how the international trade would look like. Even if I, go back to a very hardcore security stuff. Even if you uh, take it from all the way from Afghanistan to the Himalaya to uh, uh, Naga Hills to all the way to uh, Myanmar, you can now see that the politics of border is once again coming back. And the politics of border, recalibration of map, everything is going on, whether uh, in a right way or a wrong way, or in terms of uh, it is through the conventions or following international order, that is immaterial at the moment, showing that the countries are now willing to uh, bypass the existing norms uh, for resource nationalism. And, and perhaps that is where the nationalism comes in. So we have to be very, very careful about that particular regime rising. And we will be seeing the same protectionism coming in the European Union, where the uh, ultra-right and rights are uh, demanding for a recalibration of European Union, asking for new nationalism, protectionism, anti-migrant uh, issues. And there is also an ev evidently uh, published by the media, European media, showing that uh, uh, the racism is also in the rise. So that is also a new reality. In that reality, how we are going to ensure migration regimes, new compliances in terms of international trade, new compliances in terms of international uh, uh, customs, and so on will come up. So we have to be prepared about it.
And hence, this arc of instability, starting from all the way Afghanistan down to Rakhine, is uh, perhaps uh, uh, would require a collective approach. And if we go for bilateral solutions for all these things, obviously uh, the result will come much uh, slower than ever that we can always uh, imagine. So given all this gamut of changes, given all this gamut of uncertainty, and given all these changes in terms of international norms, standards, and practices, perhaps this is a high time when we always look forward to multilateralism and multi, uh, multi-stakeholderism. And perhaps all these issues should come from the bottom too. Because if you look at the tech giants coming up and how the social media is now uh, eroding or challenging the monopoly of state over power, or ideologies, or perhaps the very traditional idea of security is uh, something that we have to understand. Therefore, the youth, which means this youth actually makes South Asia much more younger than most of the regions. And this younger region or the younger economy or consumption pattern that is unfolding has to be taken into consideration and we should look beyond our very old ideas of statist responses to uh, of diplomacy, foreign relations, negotiations, bargaining, or even the institutional regimes. Thank you, Dr. Park. Uh, thank you, Professor Sahaf uh, and um, Khan, uh, for your excellent presentation. And you have wrapped up in the given time. Uh, so thank to the all uh, the scholars, those who have presented your views, uh, uh, a very uh, excellent ideas for how this post-pandemic world order will be uh, will be taking shape, and how and how the regional uh, powers or all the countries in the region will be uh, will be looking to implement their policies. Uh, uh, thank you, Saab. As you talked about, you know, like how this multi. Uh, lateralism will be shaking in the days to come and what are the challenges posed in terms of uh, the traditional or uh, security uh, uh, mindset and the newer uh, security challenges and at the same time definitely the movement of the people the train uh, migration trained and of course the uh, you know the addressing these things from uh, you know like democratic framework or, or any kind of lack uh, that and of course, uh, climate change issues and uh, uh, most of the uh, development issues, uh, which are very much related to the security concerns of the state. And so uh, I'm waiting uh, for Paki or Dr. Pramod. Do you have collected some questions? Otherwise, I have only a few questions or one question uh, asked to the Professor Bharadwaj here in the in the group chat others if you have collected from uh youtube or or facebook live or 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 in the chat room Paki, do you have some questions Otherwise, there are a few in chat box we are pasting okay, some more can you can you post these questions so we can have a uh, there is one for sunday sir uh, it's there on the yeah. chat box yeah. yes sir please note us a minute or two the questions will be right there Yeah, I've seen. Uh, shall I answer or you will read out the question? Yeah, better. Uh, you don't need to read the question, sir. Just uh, let's go for what uh, India will be, uh, you know, like, you know. I have one question. In, policy in terms of recent developments in India China prospect. I. By the time we'll take other questions. Please go ahead, Professor Sanjay. Okay, uh, I, I can see one question is raised to uh, me in this box. Uh, in uh, they are comparing with the Modi's foreign policy and Manmohan Singh's foreign policy, uh, particularly with the neighboring countries. I do find that uh, Manmohan Singh uh, had basically extended the foreign policy what uh, what Gujral was talking about, uh, following the policy of non-reciprocity. But what he had added. Uh, two very important points uh, in his
government of course we had very good uh, very good uh, relations uh, during uh, during manmohan singh government but i do find that modi had tried to uh, activate in more uh, enthusiastically with the neighboring countries and introduced neighborhood uh, first policy and that you see that while uh, taking his first visit he went to bhutan and then went to uh, nepal and then sri lanka and bangladesh all the countries he tried to uh, to explore these countries and try had a, a, an approach that let us develop together uh, or or try to bring all the uh, the neighboring countries uh, into uh, into uh, uh, developmental uh, developmental port but what happened that uh, uh, that and and of course i would i i would categorically say that he tried to uh, keep a very secular foreign policy uh, very 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 objective foreign policy while developing relations with the neighboring countries he tried to detach the domestic uh, issues with the foreign policy and neighborhood policy issues but it could not it could not work well while the domestic issues uh, had uh, had uh, created a problem uh, with the neighboring countries Uh, particularly while i'm talking today in in context of bangladesh uh, that the two issues that nrc and uh, nrc and citizenship act had adversely impacted uh, in the uh, in the mindsets of the people of uh, bangladesh and they are not very feeling very comfortable the, the, the leadership is also very conscious about while they are dealing with uh, with with uh, with, uh, with the india in nepal also you can see we had mishandled the issue of Uh, blockade in 2015 uh, uh, 15 so we could not do and even in sri uh, in in sri lanka also while sri sena came into power we tried to develop very good relations but you can't you can't do everything what uh, as per your wishes but i would submit one very interesting point that modi while he came into power he tried to cultivate pakistan as well he went to pakistan even without any formal uh, or without any agenda or in informal uh budget and uh, he tried to use the soft power diplomacy that we should uh, come together for india and, and pakistan to fight against terrorism we should resolve all the issues and let us go but it could not go and what happened for, finally while it, while it it could not work out that india had developed a strategy india had a very significant shift from uh, the pakistan in pakistan for foreign policy from soft power strategy to a hard power strategy and had taken two steps that that uh, to to teach pakistan one was that deterrence by punishment we punished pakistan while they were cultivating the terrorist development uh, uh, activities okay. uh, and yeah. i'll just finish the, yeah. so 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 uh, deterrence by punishment and then uh, had surgical strikes and another one like denial strategy that we will Uh, we will upgrade our 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 borders our intelligence services not that, that these issues could not uh, repeat manmohan singh had a bad time during pakistan while we had uh, mumbai attack and and and, and all uh, all these issues so i do find that yes there are continuity of manmohan singh's foreign policy uh, in in in, in modi's foreign policy but of course there are issues that the domestic issues could not detach from the a uh, neighbor uh, with, with the neighboring countries in the foreign policy issues and that had little bit uh, disrupted the way but i am sure pa- uh, bangladesh india nepal india and it, nepal sri lanka uh, india sri lanka they will prosper together they will have better understanding in near future thank you okay. thank you thank you professor uh, bharadwas uh, uh, we are running out of time but we have one question for each uh, professor swaran singh Uh, a question is here for you is that how you look at uh, india china class in uh, you know the context of sanju's uh, theory or its contribution to the chinese civilization and uh, so uh, it will be good if you wrap up uh, your answer within 3 minutes sir thank you doctor but 3 uh, minutes is a long time on uh, online uh, interactions Uh, so the obviously would uh, look at it in terms of uh, inter societal inter civilizational uh, mindset contest uh, between uh, two civilizational states uh, as we exist today 
so if the chinese are to be understood in terms of what they are doing vis-a-vis -vis india uh, from sunzu perspective then i think we have to understand that galwan valley incidents of 15th june was an aberration and therefore a complete silence uh, from chinese leadership in sharing any information about what happened from their side in terms of casualties or any other losses indeed there is a enormous controversy since yesterday about a tombstone being found on alma about a soldier from guchian who apparently died on the chinese side on june 15th galwan clashes so the complete silence from china on mentioning anything about even martyrdom 30th september is the chinese martyrdom day so we don't know if chinese will still recognize the martyrdom of their soldiers in galwan valley simply because it's an aberration to them they want to influence india and and make india understand the asymmetric relationship that has evolved so if you notice uh, starting from tang xiaoping period and visit of rajiv gandhi two sides started ignoring the border and started saying let us focus on areas where we can agree and then from wenchiapo onwards you started hearing there is enough space for china and india to grow in this world together saying that two tigers can still live on the same hill that was the chapter which has apparently come to end now and we are moving into the next chapter but chinese are still pursuing that sunza civilization mode so as sanjay was mentioning you know sheikh hasina still finds china more attractive the lower of commercial projects is being used visibly all neighbors of india nepal is the latest fantastic example of prime minister's government being sustained by the help of chinese and the way chinese ambassador how yanchi is being presented by media in kathmandu is an excellent example of how chinese would try to influence maldives sri lanka bangladesh of course pakistan is their most closest allied ally in the context so chinese would like to build an asymmetric relationship now the difference is that during prime minister modi's Thank period you. and i'll last 30 seconds for this during prime minister modi's time we are moving the next chapter from internalizing asymmetry to now standing up to china and i think therefore the clash is taking a completely new picture between china and india thank you so much thank you professor uh, dr samuram simkhara are you hearing me there's a question for you that what will be the new world order and who will lead it will it be led by uh, i mean the new world order would be led china led world order so you have 2 to 3 minutes doctor sipkara so that obviously is um, is the billion rupees question you know uh, but that will depend on the nature of the coming paradigm you know global paradigm which one prevails that is why i have described the current global paradigm as a paradigm flux you know one paradigm the cold war paradigm of conflictual polarity has ended what is the nature of the new paradigm is it going to be a, again a bipolar post world war world war 2 uh, post cold war order of the us being the unchallenged superpower in the world is it going to be a bipolar one or can the world transform itself to what i call a competitive and cooperative plurality that in fact there are multiple uh, sort of great powers coexisting competing but also coexisting that's the question thank but, you uh, let me conclude with one thing that uh, you know i uh, because of the time i couldn't uh, and that is where i see the centrality of india and of course in the in the conversation this morning the centrality of jnu you know i'm i'm so delighted to be in the midst of almost the entire panel of uh, jnu scholars and jnu alumni so the point is where i see the problem we are all too familiar with the historic debate on realism and idealism as students and practitioners of ayur oriental or western conventional or modern you know the interface between 
power and its use, its exercise, has preoccupied political wisdom and political action all over. But to just give you an example of how this confusion is prevailing, uh, but did we know that Chanakya in ancient India, regarded as one of the earliest of the thinkers of statecraft, and of course the realist, and his Western counterpart Machiavelli, his Western counterpart, both converge on the use of power like this. Where Machiavelli in his Prince says, and I'm quoting, yet it cannot be called prowess to kill fellow citizens, to betray friends, to be treacherous, pitiless, irreligious. These, were, these ways can win a prince power, but not glory. And that precisely echoes what Chanakya and his Niti, famous counsel, Ahar Nindra Bhayamai Thunani, Samani Chaitani Nidam Pasunam, Gyanam Narana Madhiko Viseso, Nenehina Pasubi Samana. Thank you, Dr. So, you know, the, the, the post-COVID-19 world is a tiny virus. We still don't know how it, was, it came up, how much it will affect, is turning the classical notions of power, you know, useless, powerless. So that is why we need a fundamental transformation in Thank the you. way we think. And that is where I think, uh, you know, Professor Khan, you know, those of us who have uh, white hairs now, will debate this issue. But who will bear the consequences of this new paradigm is the youth. And that is what I found very interesting. And hope that is where I see the centrality of India in the sense that India will be under pressure on from both sides. And what India decides to do, I think will determine the nature of the coming global paradigm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sinkara. And, uh, question, P Professor Khan, uh, how you look at regionalism or the sub-regionalism, you know, after the failure of SAC, the BIMSTEC is in the scenario. So what do you think of that is if BIMSTEC fails, will India be held responsible for the failure of regionalism in the Southeast Asia is the question pointed to you, Professor Khan. Uh, you have two to three minutes to wrap up your ideas. Uh, I will just wrap it up in two minutes. First of all, uh, let us get our narratives first, right first. The first thing is, SARC is not failure. What we can always argue that it is slow and it requires reform. Had it been a failure, none of these countries would have sent their directors to sit in Kathmandu. So there is an understanding uh, uh, within the countries that today or tomorrow SARC will have to be revived. So that's number one. Number two is that it has limitations. Now this limitation has to be uh, removed. Bilateral talks should be allowed, uh, institutional reforms could be done, and eventually all the countries, if I take uh, Narendra Modi's initiative of uh, virtual conference, that gives you a clear understanding. Even if you look at uh, the Prime Minister of Nepal or Prime Minister of Bangladesh or Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, everybody is now strongly talking about it. So it is a matter of time uh, how we can bolster the process of SARC and bring reform to it. The second thing is BIMSTEC is fairly a new institution. It sits between two regions of Southeast Asia and South Asia. So it also requires a little bit of reform, uh, at least if not for Bangladesh only or India only, but also for Nepal and Bhutan to have a greater access to all the way to Southeast Asian markets. So that is exactly where we have to work on and bring essential expansion uh, of BIMSTEC. Now, whether India shall be blamed or not, I mean, I won't say that uh, India shall be blamed or any country as such shall be blamed for any kind of hostageness. I mean, whether it is Pakistan, India, or any country. The very simple, obvious reason is that the reforms were not uh, essentially being driven by neither the private sector, nor the civil society, nor the academia, or perhaps even the state leaders or the domestic politics. Until or unless these things come up, uh, I don't think uh, uh, any country 
should be blamed for uh, for its uh, dormantness or perhaps uh, not moving forward to the desired uh, desired output. Thank you. Saha, thank you. Uh, Thirty seconds. Yeah, please, Professor. Please, Sir Nasim. Make a small mention. My very dear friend, Ambassador Sim Khanna, he's like elder brother to me. I respect his scholarship enormously. But I thought, you know, since I am from New Delhi, I must mention the comparison with the Macaulay. I think is uh, extremely limiting to Kautilya. The scholars around the world have done that uh, comparison and often have come to the conclusion that Kautilya talks about Dharma Yudha. His uh, Ethics is not secular or political ethics. So Megabli tries to create an, an autonomous template of ethics which has its own grammar. Whereas Kautilya is still contesting within the Brahminical culture of India, ancient India. So I think it's a slight distinction that uh, makes Kautilya much wider, bigger, deeper. Uh, and relatively Megabli much more contemporaneous and uh, allow me to say superficial. So uh, uh, I, I am one of those people who believes comparing Kautilya to Maikabli is extremely limiting Kautilya. Uh, and I was uh, saying enormous things about Sunza, uh, but I think Sunza would be a better comparison with Kautilya because both of them represent a civilizational ethos and are not focusing on contemporaneous uh, immediate issues on the plateau. Uh, with the apologies to my elder brother, I thought I must uh, mention this uh -huh. point of Thank you, Professor. We will keep talking. I mean, sharing. But, uh, that, what, can I just make one uh, thirty-second comment? Uh, uh, okay, but um, I absolutely agree. In fact, there is no point of disagreement in the sense that that is the reason why uh, I said, uh, you know, India will pay the centrality because you know to be a great power, you need the other paraphernalia of power. You need a big economy. You need a great you need military power, you need big population, geography, and so on. But you also need the power of ideas that others feel to, st to uh, you know, uh, emulate. And that is where I see the problem today, in the sense that the China and India have now, I mean, uh, America, have placed themselves on the two polarity of both other elements of power, but also in terms of the notion of governance in the type of politics. So in that sense, uh, I absolutely agree that with wisdom like Kautilya's, I only quoted, you know, in the sense that they have to support my idea of the exercise of judicious exercise of power and to look at different elements of power in the classical, you know, international discourse on realism versus idealism. Thank you. That was the only thing. Thank Otherwise, you. I agree with you absolutely. Thank you. In fact, Kautilya has a much larger vision of statecraft than the uh, counsel that Machiavelli gave to, the, to his prince. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, my gurus, and thank you, friends. Thank you, Dr. Pramod, uh, NICE, and WPC for organizing this webinar and, you know, like making all this possible in the COVID era and where we are talking about the post COVID era and you know, after pandemic, how the world order will be and the world strategies are converging or diverging. And as I mentioned at the beginning that Tip Huntington talked about the class of civilizations, slightly we are uh, re, I mean, calling the class of development models. At the same time, we are Revisiting Sanju, 500 BC, Thucydides again 500 BC, Kautilya 300 BC, and Gautam Buddha for peace and tranquility 500 BC. So this is where we all have in our mind for the greater cause of the humanity how we will be moving, how we will be looking the world order, world strategies, and all these things. In a, in a greater uh, context, you all have contributed. Uh, excellent ideas. And what I see is, uh, yes, when we talk about the geopolitical or geoeconomic or the geo-civilizational uh, notions, uh, we'll be talking about the larger, uh, you know, the 
population of the world humanity. And as I mentioned briefly, yes, there are uh, other sessions we'll be talking about the migration, uh, employment, climate change, all these issues, but uh, traditional and the non-traditional notions of uh, security are, are very related uh, with this very post uh, pandemic world order. So I think uh, the organizers have rightly uh, you know, placed this uh, idea of post pandemic world order and uh, requested uh, prolific scholars from South Asia to speak in uh, with Frank Mine. Uh, so uh, I will thank again uh, the organizers and thank you all uh, panelists and the participants and those who have raised the questions. Uh, so I'm honored here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. I hope that I'm audible. Yes, yes. Yes, you are audible. Uh, so, distinguished chair, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, with this we come to the end of this session. I take great honor in proposing the word of thanks on behalf of NICE to all those who have contributed in this event to make it a resounding success. We would like to express our sincere gratitude and thank Dr. Deepak Prakash Pat for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. Our sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations in a very short time period provided to them. From discussing about Sun Tzu Indian foreign policy to discussing about the regional cooperation, I personally felt that the discussion was very, in, very much enthralling. It undoubtedly felt like diving into the blues of international relations with every presentation that was given by speakers. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from diplomatic community, experts, ac academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, I cannot forget to thank our, our audience because they've been the ones who have been giving us the questions and they are the ones who have participated in the webinar so well. People who have been watching our YouTube channel, thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making the session productive with your questions. We're truly honored to have you all with us this, this morning and hope to stay connected with all of you in future as well. It's been a pleasure. Also, do join us in our next session. Thank you.